How many of you, when you pray, you sometimes, or even a lot of the time, have this vague feeling that there's still something lacking that you didn't do that you should have done, you know? You know, the devil does not want us to pray with confidence. He wants us to pray with fear and doubt and wondering and I used to have the exact same thing. As many years as I've been praying and will continue to pray, I used to have that feeling on a regular basis too. Well, you know, I should have said more. Or maybe I didn't pray about the right thing or maybe I just didn't say it the right way. And so a lot of times when I keep having a repetitive problem that I know according to the word is not right. You see, no matter how we feel, if what we feel is not in agreement with the word, then what we feel is wrong and the word is right. Amen? So, for example, if I ask God to forgive me for something I've done wrong and I still feel guilty, then I know that guilt is a lie. The Word of God is not a lie. Because if I've asked and received, then God is faithful. So no matter how I feel, the Word of God is what's right. And as long as we continue to live by our feelings and not even confront the lies of the devil, but just go around feeling that way, then the enemy's always gonna have an upper hand. So I just decided, well, if I'm gonna pray, then I'm not gonna spend time after I pray feeling like my prayers were useless. So I wanna get to the bottom of this and find out what's going on. And one of the things that I felt like that God showed me was that I complicated it. And that I thought that it depended on length of time or eloquence in what was said. But he taught me that prayer, effective, life-changing, dynamic prayer can be so simple, just so amazingly simple. I have one great-grandchild, and he's, uh, I guess Jeremiah is about three, and um, his mommy one night had a real bad stomach ache and she was laying in bed, kind of doubled up in pain. And he went over and laid his hand on her, said he was gonna pray for her. And he said, Jesus, mommy, ouchie, <laughs> amen. <laughs> but listen, she said she almost immediately the pain stopped, and she started feeling better. Actually, I came to a point in my life at one time where God actually challenged me. He said, I want you to ask me for what you want and need with as few a words as possible. Hmm. Yeah, it's harder than you think. You know, it's... It, it's hard when you've done something wrong to say, Father, I'm so sorry, forgive me for that, thank you. No, we wanna go on, oh God, oh God, oh please forgive me God, please, please, please forgive me, oh God, I've been so bad, please forgive me God, I promise I'll never do it again. Yes, you will. <laughs> don't even waste your time making promises you can't keep. You're better off to say, I'll definitely do it again if you don't help me. <laughs> so why don't we learn that the power of prayer is not in how many words or how eloquent or how long, but I believe it's two things. I think it's faith. Do I believe that God hears me? Do I believe he cares about me and wants to be involved in my life? Well, I can't read the Bible and not believe that. And I think that prayer must be Sincere. You're going to see in Scripture today that the Bible says that the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much, makes tremendous power available. I love that in the Amplified. When we pray, tremendous power woo, is made available. Tremendous power is made available. I already know that tonight I'm going to pray for people who have back problems. God's already put that on my heart. And so, when we pray tonight, when I just stand up here and pray and we all agree, 
tremendous power is going to be made available. But it's not just up to me. You're going to need to release your faith too and say, oh, I received that. In Jesus' name. And then if you leave and you go, oh, well, nothing happened. <laughs> you know where we usually lose our faith? That's while we're waiting. We can pray in such faith, and boy, we can get really excited and have faith when we see a manifestation. But we receive the promises of God, the Bible says, through faith and patience. And a lot of times we have to, to wait. And one of the things that I've learned to do during that waiting time is any time that doubt comes against me, I open my mouth and say out loud, I believe that God is working in my life right now. I believe that God is working in my life right now. And I'm going to give you some good scriptures to back these things up. But I believe it's just the simple faith. God hears me. He wants to help me. And also then just being sincere about what you're praying. And I think that takes focus. How many of you find it extremely difficult to even focus for 10 minutes in prayer. So this morning, I looked at my clock, it was eight o'clock, and I, of course, you know, I'd been praying in and out here and there, you know, we, and that's good, God hears all that, you know. But I wanted to have 10 minutes of focused, uninterrupted prayer for this session this morning. And I had to really set my mind to do that and not let anything else get my attention. I think, to me, that's what fervent effectual prayer is. Fervent doesn't have to be yelling. It doesn't have to be crying. You know, I read books about people who weep and cry in prayer, and I think that's marvelous, but I don't cry very easy. And so I'm sure hoping God answers my prayers if I don't cry. Amen? I think it's fervent, effectual prayer, sincere, focused prayer. When we pray, we are talking to God. So let's act like we're talking to God and not act the way we do when we're talking to somebody else that we are giving them about 10% of our attention and something else, 90% of our attention. And so I want to share with you this morning and first I called it reasons why prayers are not answered, but we can also call it ways to get your prayer answered. <laughs> Either way, we're going to talk about prayer. Well, the first thing is, is you're not ever going to get an answer if you don't ask. So the first royal law of prayer is you have not because you ask not. Now, I just wonder how many people in here this morning or possibly people watching by television, you have tremendous needs in your life, but you're not asking. Maybe you're wishing. <laughs> Well, I wish. And I tell this story pretty often because it amazed me, but it fits right into this teaching this morning, and this is just a great example. Met a woman in a department store, and she recognized me and, from TV, and so we started chatting. Yes, she was a Christian. She'd been in this certain church for, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. And... Um, so I was just asking her questions about the department store, and you know, I said, do you guys work on commission or do you work on salary? And she said, well, we actually work on salary, but we do have a quota that we have to meet. And if we don't meet that quota, then we'll get a warning, and then if we still don't meet that quota, then we can actually lose our jobs. And so to me, that's just a real easy fix because of what I've learned about the Word of God. So I said, well, why don't you just pray that God will give you favor so the people shopping here will come to you for their purchases. And she looked at me kind of like some of you are looking at me like, huh. Well, all I've been doing is just standing around being afraid I'm gonna lose my job. And she looked at me and she said, well, would it be okay to pray for something like that? I said, honey, <laughs> you 
You can talk to God about anything and everything that concerns you. If I needed to meet my quota at work and all it was going to take would be for some of the customers to float over toward me, then why would I not ask God to send them in my direction? Well, what if that wasn't his will? Well, then don't worry about it. You won't get it. <laughs> this is not going to be hard today. We are going to learn that we need to pray according to God's will. And you know, you can throw out, if it be your will, as much as you want to. I don't suggest doing that if it's like something you know for sure is in the Word of God. I don't think you need to pray, God, if it's your will, save my son. I think that's pretty obvious, but, you know, I just, I gave all that stuff up. I don't worry about that stuff anymore. I've got a relationship with God. I trust him. I believe he trusts me. I don't want anything he doesn't want me to have. And I'm going to pray like a wild, crazy woman for everything that I can think of. Amen? Because if there's anything that anybody can get, I'm going to get some of it. Did you hear me? Well, who do you think you are? Nobody. And that's the beauty of it. Absolutely an undeserving, less than nothing, nobody. But when God does things for those nobodies, that's when we see his glory. Amen. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to think. Well, who do you think you are to pray like that? In James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What causes strife? Why do fights and feuds and quarrels how do they originate among you? And many, many years ago, when God first began to give me revelation out of James 4, 1 and 2, I can tell you my life was full of strife, feuds, fights, and quarrels. <laughs> now, that's not the case now, but when I saw that, what leads to strife, discord, and feuds, and how do quarrels and conflicts and fights originate among you, it had my interest. How many of you need a lot more peace in your life than what you experience have way too many fights and way too many quarrels and so much strife where you work and even strife in the church and strife in the home and strife is bickering arguing heated disagreement but it's also an angry undercurrent and I hate that part worse than anything it's like that angry undercurrent that can even be in the church among the people in the choir <laughs> Come on. Well, I, I think I should be the worship leader. I can s sing better. <laughs> she can't even sing her way out of a paper sack, and I've got a great voice. And, yeah. Come on. Come on now. So he says, what, what's the cause of all this stuff? God's called us to peace. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. Wear your shoes of peace. He said, do they not arise from your sensual desires? So that's fleshly, carnal desires. It's, let's make it plain, it's stuff that we want. <laughs> it's a position, it's a promotion, it's finance, it's wanting what somebody else has. James 4, 2. You are jealous and you covet what other people have and your desires go unfulfilled. So he's saying, you don't get what you want. You're not going to get it that way. So you become a murderer because to hate is to murder as far as your hearts are concerned. Now let's talk about the gray area here for a minute. You say, well, I don't hate anybody. But do you love them? Well... No, I wouldn't exactly say that, but I don't really hate them. Well, you know, I don't see any other options in the Bible. It's like, <laughs> you burn with envy and anger, and you're not able to get the gratification, the contentment, and the happiness that you seek. So, before we read the answer, just look. He's saying, look, what causes all this upset in people's lives? Why can't people settle down and be content and be happy? It's because of all the stuff you want that you don't have. 
I mean, it, if you're unhappy today, isn't it about something you want that you don't have? <laughs> if this is too deep for you, we can go slow. <laughs> How many years was I unhappy because my ministry wasn't bigger than what it was? Lots of years. <laughs> you know what? We're on a journey. And life is not all just about the destination. It's more about the journey than anything else. And you need to learn to enjoy the journey. And that means that while I'm headed to what I think I want, God may actually do so much in my life that I'll realize by the time I get there, that's not even what I want. <laughs> oh, some of you sweet, beautiful single ladies, you just got yourself convinced you just cannot be happy if you're not married. And some of you people have been married 30 years, you're convinced you cannot be happy if you have to stay married. But I'm just saying that no matter what we have, unless we learn to be content with what God's giving us at the time, I said, unless we learn to be content with what God's giving us at the time. I love what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I've learned how to be content. And the Amplified Bible says, satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed no matter what state I'm in. Now, he didn't say satisfied to the point where I never want to see change. See, you can want to see change. You can want things to be different in your life. You can want to get married someday, but you don't have to be unhappy every day until you are. Amen. Amen. You have not because you ask not. That's the answer to the whole mess. <laughs> Why is there so much strife and quarreling and bickering and arguing? It's all the stuff you want. You don't get it. You see somebody that's got it. You get jealous and envious. You still don't end up with what you want. What's the problem? You have not because you ask not. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but when I read that many years ago, I tell you what, I was into so many works of the flesh. You know what works of the flesh are? It's us trying to do what only God can do. Can I tell you, if you're trying to change the person you're married to, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> Won't work. You could humbly go to God, stressing humbly. You could humbly go to God and say, now God, I know I got a lot of my own problems. And if I'm seeing this wrong, then just ignore me. But I'm asking you to change that. <laughs> our Henry, our Herbert, our Charlie, or if you're a guy here today, Mary Lou, Mary Jane, Janet, whatever. This is for all of us. We try to change our kids. And if you got four, all four of them are totally different. We want them to be like us and we don't even like who we are yet. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be a nightmare if everybody in the whole house was like you. So I'm telling you, I just about killed myself in works of the flesh. And when I saw that scripture, Oh, the joy of God hit my soul. You have not because you ask not. Now, there's a little bit of fear in that because then there's this thought, well, what if I want it, but God don't want me to have it? What if I want it, but God doesn't want me to have it? Maybe I better keep trying to get it myself in case he won't do it. <laughs> you know, we'll pray, but we always want a backup plan, don't we? Just in case God doesn't come through, we got kind of a backup plan, a plan B.
Oh, you can never enjoy your life until you get out of works of the flesh and learn that you have not because you ask not. And don't be afraid to ask God. He loves you. He wants to help you. You know, little kids ask for a lot of things that aren't good for them, and the parent just doesn't give it to them. <laughs> if God doesn't give you something you want, it's out of love. He's not holding out on you. He just knows something that you don't know yet. Come on now. God is able, Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that we could ever dare to hope, ask, or think according to his power that works in us. Jesus said, ask. You know, sometimes if I need my prayer life or my faith in prayer bolstered, I know where most of the scriptures are that say ask, and I will get them out and just read them. And I've got them all this morning, but I'm, I don't have time to put all these up. But the word ask means to request, to call for, to desire, and I love this part, to make a demand on what's already yours. God's already provided everything that we need. When I go to the bank and it's my money in the bank, I ask politely, but I'm really just making a demand on what's already mine. But you have not because you ask not. We can't assume and presume with God. I get his help when I humble myself and ask for his help. I can't just assume, well, if God wants to help me, he'll help me. The humble get the help. I ask God to help me. God, help me. And I don't know about you, but I need a lot of help getting through one day. No matter who you are or what you've done in life or what you may need, you can talk to God about it. And that's what we call prayer. God's Word says that we are to ask. So simple and yet so powerful. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says this. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Insurgency have gone around Iraq, persecuting Christians, forcing them to leave their villages, their homes, their businesses. Many of those families have seen their children abducted, their husbands being killed right there in front of them. The Iraqi Christians are persecuted intentionally in Iraq. So all the families are leaving. The majority has come to Lebanon because they feel safe, because there's a big Christian community. When we looked around, uh, and uh, so the need uh, of the Iraqis, we felt the Lord is leading us to the target this group of people for the love and compassion we can provide. Hand of Hope was the first ministry to come alongside with us. Hand of Hope said, well, we want to be the hand of Jesus to the broken world of Lebanon. And a children program when kids come and learn about Jesus and go back home and they sing what they have learned, the worship songs, the families, they start asking questions. Why are kids so happy and joyful again? Why do they have their smiles back again? Because in Iraq, a kid stayed home 24 seven. They're not allowed to leave home, to play, to have fun because they're scared of car bombing, of kidnapping uh, for ransom. So here they're finding their joy again and it's exciting for us. Joyce Meyer makes this happen. Joyce Meyer uh, supports the Heart for Lebanon Iraqi project. So all the food we buy, uh, if it was the snacks, the lunch, the trips we do, the camps, the retreats, all of that, and alone we cannot do it because it's a big burden and it's high expense. And uh, they want to help us bless the Iraqi refugees by that. So we feel cared and loved by that as well.
Vind je het moeilijk om te bidden? Te ingewikkeld? Bidden kan zoiets moois zijn. Praat met God eenvoudig over alles. Een boek van Joyce Meyer kan jou hierbij helpen. De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed. Leer hoe je met God over alles kunt praten. Je kunt het boek De kracht van een eenvoudig gebed nu bestellen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch op 026 20 22 100.